Okay, moving on to our next uh, presenter. We've just heard about the implications of having smarter cars in the future, which is a natural lead in to our next presenter, uh, thinking about the future of transportation systems in smart cities. Tyler Swedak is the executive director of the Colorado Smart Cities Alliance based in Denver. And here is his presentation on the future of smart cities. Hey everyone, I am really excited to be speaking with the Future Vision Symposium. My name is Tyler Swedok. I am the executive director of the Colorado Smart Cities Alliance, and we work with governments across our state and pair them with private sector partners who can help bring technologies to solve the challenges that we face across our state. And so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the future of cities and how technology is impacting them and what that might look like five years from now based on the experience that we're currently working on today and the projects that we have that are currently active. So first, I essentially wanna lay some groundwork for what a smart city is. I hope and imagine that many of you have talked through the idea of smart cities in your classes or come across them in the media. And ultimately, cities are changing rapidly. Um, they're being impacted by technology in a number of ways. But the traditional definition you find, you'll find out there is uh, smart cities are using technology and the internet of things to make data-driven decisions that improve quality of life. And so, uh, it's a pretty basic definition. It's actually much more complex than that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Ultimately, technology is intersecting with cities and with government in a number of ways. All of these new transportation, or excuse me, all of these new technologies like the Internet of Things, the ability for things to talk to each other and to talk to a network, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, edge computing, automation, electrification, and the sharing economy, these are all disrupting industries overnight, right? The, the most valuable automaker in the world is now Tesla, and they make one vehicle for every 100 that General Motors does, um, and it happened in just the course of about 15 years. And so these industries are all changing, and um, a lot of them are playing in cities. And so governments are forced to, to work with them um, and are using them as new tools, these new technologies to, to solve problems in their own communities. And so governments are either users or customers of a lot of these new technologies. They either have to regulate or provide policy for some of them. Think Uber and Lyft and how cities are having to consider regulating them now that they know that they do contribute to congestion in cities. A lot of these technologies require access to a city environment for a, a laboratory, right? They need to, to use these technologies in the real world. Cities have lots of data that can be valuable to these companies. And ultimately we need to figure out, our governments need to understand how they should be planning and zoning based on these new technologies like an Airbnb. And so in all of these ways, cities are changing. We're at a, an enormous precipice of, of how we are going to be interacting with our environment. And I think this picture is pretty indicative of where we find ourselves today. And that uh, at one point horses were the main form of transportation, right? Um, but then cars came about and now we have a whole bunch of new technologies that are threatening to change that paradigm for uh, hopefully for the better, but certainly uh, change. Ultimately, smart cities look at these technologies and figure out how they can use them as new tools. Um, so uh, whether it's IoT or not, it should not really de define how we think of smart cities. It's really the process by which they solve problems and how they look for private sector partners who can help them do that and technologies that can make cities better. Those problems in our state are unique, right? And in the research that we do with our governments, we work on a lot of different issues. But these six core themes continue to come up in, with our governments and are therefore serving as where a lot of change is going to happen and technology can be applied to approach them differently. Um, I'm not gonna be able to talk through all of these and how tech is being applied to each of them in cities across the state. I'm only gonna be able to focus on one and that is gonna be mobility. But of all the topics, mobility is probably combining most of the technologies out there to influence the future of how you're gonna be interacting with cities five years from now. So really there's four major trends that we're gonna talk through real quick at a very high level. First is electrification, right, um, of, of transportation. So 
internal combustion engines will not be a thing uh, 20 years from now. And that's impacting transportation in a number of ways. Autonomy or robotics, right? The ability for vehicles to drive themselves or to form certain functions by themselves. The ability for mobility to be connected to other modes. And then ultimately the, the sharing economy and, and mobility as a service. So we'll start with electrification. Ultimately, five years from now, a lot of these trends are going to just continue. They're starting today, but they'll be much more prominent and they'll be actionable, tangible, physical things you can all touch. So first is freight and delivery. You're going to see and are, we are seeing every single class of vehicle electrify itself. So from class eight tractor trailers, uh, from Mercedes and Tesla, all the way down to um, your, your small vehicles and your micro mobility. We are also going to see electric vertical takeoff and landing in urban aircrafts. So that might seem really far-fetched, but ultimately the, the idea of, I guess, the Jetsons is, is going to come to life in one way, shape, or form. And these aircraft that you see here are, are a version of that, where they can take off vertically and land. They're fully electric and um, ultimately might all also be automated. You're going to see a lot faster charging. So, you know, these, these class eight tractors are going to be able to charge in, in 30 minutes or less, and your personal vehicle could charge in less than 15 minutes. Um, and then uh, vehicle to grid. So not only are these vehicles going to take charge from the grid, but they'll also be able to send electricity back to the grid to charge your home or to charge a building or, or to charge the grid overall. Uh, so all of those things are gonna, gonna continue and be very prominent five years from now. Automation, so uh, there's a ton here that I, we won't be able to get into, but ultimately five years from now, the things that have been piloted and demonstrated will be very real services that you'll be able to leverage um, in one way, shape or form in goods delivery and freight. So those little robots you see down there on the right hand side are already being deployed uh, in California and actually here in Denver at the University of Denver to deliver food um, to the, the last mile. Uh, first and last mile uh, transit. So that shuttle you see up top is, is a version of a fully autonomous shuttle that can take people to and from at low speeds uh, transit from that first and last mile. You're going to see new transit modes where, you know, instead of just a bus that's a fixed route, it's going to be what's called micro transit, where on demand, you can hire your, for example, Lyft or Uber, but from your transit agency and we'll come pick you up. Um, and then things like dedicated lanes, if autonomous vehicles continue to, to grow in popularity, uh, we already see states like Michigan promising dedicated lanes for connected and autonomous vehicles. Connectivity is another big one. So ultimately all vehicles in the very, very near future, definitely in the next five years, will be able to talk to each other in real time in order to avoid accidents. And they'll also be able to talk to their surroundings. So the graphic that's a little grainy up top is um, showing you a vehicle to everything communication world where cars can talk to each other in real time. They can talk to pedestrians and your cell phone so they can avoid running into folks and accidents. And then also infrastructure will be able to talk back to cars. So um, think a DOT that uh, can listen to the roadway and understand exactly where a road is icy and send you a message right when you need it if you're going too fast into the corner in order to avoid um, spinning out of control. And then finally, adapted traffic signals. So right now, uh, your traffic signals are on a fixed timing plan. Um, in the future and today even, but five years from now for sure, they're going to have sensors at the intersection that sense the real-time traffic and can change the light red or green across a whole corridor based on um, artificial intelligence and the ability to understand what is most optimal for the entire grid to save you time um, getting across town. And then the final one is uh, shared services. So uh, multimodality or the idea of not just driving your own car but having multiple modes to get around is going to continue to grow. These things called mobility hubs, essentially you can access all of those mobility services you might need and not own them, right? You don't have to own your own personal transportation anymore. Micromobility is going to continue to grow. Um, and then uh, ultimately everything can and will be done through your phone. 
And it'll be combined to where if you want to take an Uber to the light rail station, hump on or jump on the light rail, um, grab a scooter to your last destination, you can do it all through one app, pay all through one app and plan it all in one app. So we went through a lot. I really look forward to your questions, but those are a few ways that um, mobility certainly will change, but all of those technologies that undermine mobility are also impacting lots of other things in cities from water um, to community engagement, to you know, public housing and affordability. So look forward to your questions and thank you for your time. Thank you, Tyler. We, like everyone else, we have five minutes for questions and we have a whole bunch to start with. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to them. Let's start with this one. Um, how do you see concepts from smart cities trickling down to smart towns and smaller communities? It's a great question. And I actually don't know that there's much of a difference. I think the idea of a smart city, the idea of a smart town, the idea of a smart neighborhood, they're all essentially the same thing. It just has to do with the scale upon which you're deploying. And most smart cities aren't really smart in that the technologies that they're deploying are not citywide. Um, they usually start in small pilots and then grow from there. And part of the biggest struggle is just how you scale these technologies and, and how you fund them over time and how you maintain them. So um, smart community, smart town, smart neighborhood. Uh, again, if you're focused on solving problems, and that's how you define a smart city and not necessarily how many sensors are out there, then they're, they're essentially one and the same. And we work with a ton of communities that are not Denver, um, like North Glen or Lone Tree that, that have very intelligent technologies that they're using every day. Um, great, thank you. You touched on a key word in your response there and that was funding. And I think that might be a real hurdle for a lot of smaller communities. How could smaller communities like Rush Colorado fund fund something like this? Yeah, funding is always an issue, no matter if you're a small city or a big city, but these technologies present a lot of partnership opportunities. And that's, that's often what, what we work on. So just as one example of partnerships that a town like Brush can, can use is um, fiber. So, you know, fiber optic networks are, are, are driving the digital infrastructure of today and into the future and cities have assets that they can leverage in attracting private sector to invest. And so if, for example, you can give um, access or right of way to uh, public land, to your roads, in exchange for um, conduit or fiber in the ground that your Verizon or your AT&T is building, um, there are lots of opportunities for that. And so that's where we specialize is finding those opportunities to lower costs for cities and find mutual benefit for the private sector and the public sector. Thanks. Okay, next question. Kind of from um, an environmental and sustainability standpoint, um, smart cities and IoT and connected everything has, I think, real potential to reduce things like greenhouse gas emissions and electricity usage by making it more efficient. Can you speak to that a little bit and, and how much savings there might be? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I spent um, most of my career in trying to build a, a supportive market for electric vehicles and, and reducing climate change emissions. And so um, there are a million different technologies out there that could be used in order to solve uh, climate change. I mean, just the grid overall, right? Um, the, the number one and two sources of, of climate changing gases uh, in our state and in the country now, number one is transportation. Number two are buildings. And so in order to reduce those, um, the grid needs to be able to support distributed energy resources like solar and wind um, or hydro. Well, actually no, hydro is pretty consistent, but um, if it's blowing at night, wind's blowing at night, right now the Excel Energy Grid can generate up to 70% of all the electricity that we use at night by wind only. The problem is we have no way to store that energy. And so, um, the grid itself needs to change and the technologies to support um, the grid. In addition to if we want to start sending electricity back to the grid from our transportation sources, um, there's a lot of uh, need for new technology. And the, if you ask the utilities that are pledging to 100% renewable energy, they're just trusting that technology is going to get them there and they don't necessarily have those answers yet. Okay, good answer. All right, uh, next question. So you're talking about in transportation needing charging stations and potentially like 
helicopters that go up and down. Um, where, yeah. where will all of these things fit in a town? Like, what's, is there a plan for that? It's a good question. I, if you ask the companies that are developing those technologies, they could tell you that they have a plan for how they would like it to work, but it's, it's much more complex than that. Um, ultimately, for you know, um, urban air mobility to, to really take off, there's going to be, need to be an, uh, an entirely new um, governance structure for how you regulate those, those vehicles that are flying at different heights. Um, and ultimately, if new modes of transportation like that take off, then fewer and fewer people will be driving using parking spaces. And so one of the ideas that's out there is to turn parking garages into mobility hubs where the top, the top level would be used for urban air mobility and take off and landing, and the others would be used for, you know, car share or scooters or, you know, um, your, your automated Tesla that drives up and picks you up. And, and, and so there's lots of ideas out there to say that anyone has a real plan of how it's exactly going to work. It would be an, uh, an oversimplification. Okay, thanks. We did have a couple more questions. Uh, we don't have time for them, but one of them was thinking about security, which is our next um, next session. So we'll try to maybe answer that in the chat if we can. Um, thank you so much, Tyler, for your information and presentation. Thank you.